Uh, welcome to talk a bit on the user management in, in, in Kubernetes or well, as the, as the title of the talk says, it's a, it go more like a lack of user, user management capabilities in Kubernetes. Uh, the whole talk kind of stems from, from uh, different, different discussions that I've had with, with people newer and newer into the, into the world of Kubernetes and, and, and kind of uh, the, the lot of confusion that, that yeah, I have now my cluster up and running. So how do I, how do I actually grant access to, to another set of users for my, for my cluster? Uh, so we are at, at KubeCon uh, 2021 and, and we're on the 101 track. So um, we're not gonna dive too deep into the, into the whole, whole topics and different, different configuration options, for example, uh, but, but we're, uh, we are going to look at the, the kind of high level high level um, topics and, and, and concepts how do how do you actually then then really manage the, the access for your users into your, your clusters um, so yeah hi I'm I'm Jussi Nummelin working at, at uh, Mirandis engineering um, I've been working with with Kubernetes and, and different cloud native technologies for the past quite a quite a few years even even actually before they were really called like cloud native stuff uh, in the past year or so i've been i've been mostly working with uh with the new open source kubernetes distro called k zeros and 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 that's basically the, the reason why you see some some mentions of it and uh, in the in the examples so so this is not really a topic on, on case zeros itself but but you'll see some examples how we do things in case zeros for example and and of course as i said it's open source so you can you can dig into that if you if you really want uh, although not entirely correct but uh the, the kind of Good way to get your mindset into in the correct correct kind of uh, uh, direction when 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 thinking about this whole users in in Kubernetes topic is is, is like really really kind of realize the fact that there, there is no really there's there's no users in Kubernetes or or users managed by Kubernetes per se. Of course, there are users using using Kubernetes, but but uh, the Kubernetes control plane doesn't really manage manage the user access for you. We'll dive into into this soon. Um, some of the topics that that we are gonna look in this session is is of course a quick look on 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 how the whole authentication, authorization, and admission control, the triple A functionality, really kind of works in a, in a high level on the API server. Uh, we are gonna have a look at that. What what is the thing that that we we say that is a user in Kubernetes? Uh, we'll have a look on 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 what are the sort of out of box options for for managing the user access, and then super quick look on 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 then how to tie the user information and user identities into into role based access control rules. But the AAA. Uh, authentication, authorization, and admission control. So those are basically the, the, the three fundamental stages when when the Kubernetes API server processes any request. Uh, and 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 as as with with many other things in Kubernetes, the, the authentication is sort of a pluggable or or at least highly configurable um, kind of kind of system or or stage on the on the API server. Uh, what what the authentication really really does is is that it it really looks at the kind of the incoming request, and then figures out that okay what is the what is the user identity of the of the thing either a human or 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 some other service that's actually making the call, uh, and every single call is is either rejected as as unauthorized or uh, tied to, to to some identity, and there's this also this uh, system anonymous kind of special identity um, that are being used, and then if the if the uh, user identity is not really really we, we cannot figure out what's the user identity. Uh, after the after the authentication stage, kind of figure out that yeah okay the the user is now Yussi. Uh, 
it just passes that 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 information as is to the to the following stages, namely namely the authorization stage, uh, and 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 kind of that's the the the, the key part to understand. The the authentication gives the user information as is as basically as a as a string, so uh, there's no no like higher higher uh, or or more fine grain than than that. It's it's just like a like a string in the process, more or less. Uh, there's basically like two two kind of categories for for user identities in in Kubernetes. Um, the service accounts, which probably everybody everybody has been has been kind of uh, kind of uh, stumbling over. Uh, and, and and service accounts are really really kind of uh, access controls and and access identities uh intended to be used for for processes like like your your core dns server running in a in a pod in a cluster of course it needs to talk to the api so we have to have some sort of a uh, authentication and identity for for core dns uh, the service accounts are essentially uh json web tokens and and they are managed by kubernetes but but the the, the service accounts are not, not really intended or designed to be used for for human users so don't you you basically of course technically you you can use them but but there's there's a lot of lot of drawbacks in there and 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 a lot of potential potential not really security holes but but let's let's call them security concerns at least uh, then of course we have the, the the normal users like myself who, who wants to access the kubernetes cluster uh, and now these normal normal users and, and normal user access is is not really managed by Kubernetes itself. Uh, if we look at the Kubernetes documentation, there's actually actually quite a sort of good explanation, and 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 especially this one one kind of sentence really nails nails it it really really well. So the API server really really expects that the, the, there's always something something that's that's more or less external to the cluster itself that that manages the the user access and 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 manages the user information so essentially user is a more or less like a transient thing so 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 the user data is not really stored on etcd uh, which of course means that there's no like like user management capabilities. So I cannot grab my my admin access to my cluster and say say like kubectl create user use. That's that's not possible. And I said the the API server has this sort of a configurable or pluggable pluggable different multiple different ways how to how to actually then identify who is the user and 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 then authenticate the user. Um, there's basically four different options out of box uh, on the API server. Uh, there's client certificates. Uh, we can use static tokens. We can use external service to validate a token. And then we can use this uh, more slightly more complex protocol called uh, OpenID Connect. It's kind of more like a, kind of like a OAuth uh, with some, some, some nuances. So let's first, first have a quick look on, on, on client certificates. So um, especially those of you who have some experience on, on setting up your own clusters, you've seen that, that yeah, there's pretty much always a, a certificate on authority that we have to create for the control plane and, and mainly for the, for the API server and, and then the, for, the, for the other control plane components. Uh, we can use this this uh, cluster wide certificate authority to actually sign client certificates, and that kind of uh, the signing with the CA it, it kind of creates this mutual trust between the client certificate and the API server. So as as long as you can create a certificate that is signed by the by the CA, the API server can use the information from the certificate itself. To, to really identify the user because it trusts it 
uh, it, it has been signing it, the, the Kubernetes CA and, and the Kubernetes control plane kind of itself has been signing the, the certificates. So of course, it, it'll it'll trust the trust the certificate. So basically, it'll be pick up the, the username from the from the common name on, of the common name field on the on the certificate, and then the possible groups group information from the from the organization uh, field. Your your distro tooling might might bring some helpers like we we've, we've done for example in K zero. So you can you you, you might get these uh, handy handy command line helper tools to, to actually create you uh, like a cube config readily parsed and and spit out with the with the client certificates created in them. Uh, of course, with 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 as with any system and 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 as with any solution, there's there's of course some gotchas, uh, uh, and and for the client cert cert authentication, the the main thing to to understand is the fact that uh, once you create and once you give a certificate for your user, it's it's pretty much impossible to actually revoke the access. So. And that's basically because the the, the CA is, is is more or less kind of static for the lifetime of the cluster. Uh, there's there's a lot of different components that relies on the on the existence on the of the CA and 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 the Kubernetes API components like the controller manager is is typically using using uh, the the client certificates also to to authenticate itself and and whatnot. So if you go and actually change the CA. Or want to recreate the CA, you have to reconfigure a lot of things on the on the API server and on the on the control plane in, in general. And 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 then again, uh, it's not really like a, it's not difficult, but it's it's not trivial to create these client certs either, and and of course requires a bit of effort. So it doesn't kind of make sense to have this sort of a sh super short-lived certificates also for your users. Or at least you have to build some fancy automation around it, and then if you want to do that, then you probably want to have want to want to look at some of the other other options too. Uh, one of the probably the simplest ways ways is to use this uh, external external uh, kind of stati static static to token authentication. Uh, so what we can do for the API server is we, we can we can pass it a, a flag called uh, token auth file, which is basically a pointer to a, a uh, CSV file uh, that has the, the user access tokens. So basically I have a token as the as the first field, and then user information, group information. And after that, I can I can use the token. As a, as a bearer token on on my API requests and and that's it, and of course you kube CDL for example and and kube config uh, format has has support of course these these static tokens too. So that's that's like super super simple way to to manage manage your your user access. But well, of course there's going to be a but. Uh, the main thing to understand with these tokens is the fact that uh, whenever you want to change something in the tokens, you want to revoke access from your coworker or somebody who left the company. You want to change a token. You want to create a new token for a new user or whatnot. Uh, you have to always reboot the API server or restart the API server. So the API server really reads in the tokens only only when it starts. And then if you are running like like multiple controllers in a in a highly available setup, of course you have to keep this whole thing in sync across all of the all of the different different controllers. And of course, as you saw, that the tokens are in plain text, so it's a uh, bit bit sketchy maybe. Uh, webhook token authentication. Uh, it's it's essentially essentially a, a kind of a external web webhook service that the API server calls to, to really both authenticate the token and then give the give the user information for the for the user who owns the token. So so 
let's say that uh, the API server sees a call with this sort of a token one uh, zero one four f blah blah blah. Uh, what it actually actually does is that uh, of course it needs to be configured to do this, but 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 essentially it calls this external webhook service and then passes on the token in this JSON uh, token review JSON format, and then the webhook will will basically respond that that yeah it's a known token for a known user so yeah good authenticate it and then it also passes passes on the 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 user information based on whatever system it, it can figure this out from it doesn't for the for the kubernetes api it doesn't really uh, matter where we where we dig out this information so the, the the external webhook service will will say that yeah the token is for Jane Doe and 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 Jane is part of the developers and QA groups. Uh, of course the, the the API server again has to be configured to use this this external token webhook. So you have to pass in the, the address for the webhook and uh, webhook service and whatnot. And most importantly, you have to be able to configure this mutual trust between the API server and the webhook service. Of course, the, it doesn't make any sense for the, for the API server to just spit out the token to any random service and then expect to get a, a like a valid valid answer back and, and just trust it. So that's not really really a possibility. So we have to be able to able to build this mutual trust with certificates between these these two entities. Uh, open ID is uh, is is Kind of, kind of similar, but then, then again, then again, really not, not, but, but, but slightly similar at least to the to the to the webhook token. So, uh, also in the case of case of OpenID Connect, the, the the whole identity management is is like fully external to the API server. So there's no like like token files or token CSVs or or anything stored on the uh, on the API server. Uh, so basically, when when an API server is configured to use this this OpenID Connect, we we essentially, and I'm 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 cutting some corners here, uh, but but essentially, uh, we are configuring the API server to trust set of JSON web tokens that are signed by by some identity provider. So again, we have to configure this sort of mutual trust between the API server and the the, the identity provider, essentially. Uh, what's cool about this 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 open ID and 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 basically on 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 JSON Web Tokens in general is the fact that the the JSON Web Token is uh, is is cryptographically signed. So when you've configured this mutual trust, uh, anybody can actually like like really easily validate and and verify that that yeah this is a a valid token and then after after validating we can dig out all the needed information from the token itself so at that point we don't actually have to call any other external service anymore so so we can really really just like validate and and verify that the token itself and then dig out all the needed information so so it's it's in a sense from the from the processing point of view, it's it's much 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 simpler. Uh, and then of course, uh, clients like like kubectl, for example, they can be configured to to automatically handle this token renewal with the with the client and the identity provider itself, with these access tokens, ID tokens, refresh tokens, and and bunch of other other configurable things. Uh, as a, as a sort of a quick quick uh, comparison between the, the different different four different options that we saw, uh, the the X509, the client certificates and, and static tokens, both are like like super simple to use and and, and super simple to set up. Uh, maybe for the for the client client certificates, uh, setting up the CA is is well. As with anything, anything that has to do with certificates, a bit a bit of a tedious thing if you, especially if you're doing the first time. But but uh, uh, in most cases, your your distro 
tooling and distro distro itself kind of handles that part so so it's 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 pretty 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 simple and straightforward to use and set up but but both of them are are actually quite inflexible in 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 a way so so it's it's hard to for example to to invalidate tokens or almost impossible to invalidate certificates uh, webhook tokens are a lot more flexible they are still quite quite easy to use uh, it requires a bit more work on the on the setup phase when we have to configure this mutual trust between the api server and the webhook service but 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 i don't i don't think that's a, that's like a, like a nightmare or anything so it's just Bit, bit more work and bit more complexity on that. Uh, OIDC, super flexible, of course, because the identity is provided fully by, by an external service, external system, like, for example, like Google accounts or, or whatnot. Uh, they are usually quite, quite easy to use. Uh, in some cases, you might have to have some helper tools in place for your client to, to actually uh, renew the certificates and, and, and whatnot. And I, I have seen uh, some, some problems also in different, different Kubernetes client libraries that, that uh, actually haven't had a, a decent and proper support for, for OpenIDs Connect. But hopefully those are, those are now fixed in most cases. Uh, as with webhook tokens, it requires a bit more setup and, and, and kind of to build this mutual trust between the API server and the OpenID provider, the identity provider itself. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm typically pushing people towards to, to configuring uh, OpenID Connect to, as, the, as the main source of, uh, uh, of access control and identity. Uh, provider for the for the API server, mainly because it's uh, it's it's the most flexible, and 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 most organizations already have some identity provider in use that that they can quite quite easily at least usually hook into the into their clusters. Okay, so now we've used let's say OpenID Connect. We've configured that to talk to the Google account services and 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 fetch the, the get the get the signed uh, JSON web tokens with with uh, the user credentials in. So okay, what do we what do we do next? Uh, so so basically the second stage on the on the kind of uh, API call kind of processing processing pipeline is 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 authorization. So and, and and basically on the authorization stage, we we the, the API server starts to figure out that yeah okay now we know that the user is Jussi, he's trying to create a pod, but is he allowed to do it? Uh, as we know that the Kubernetes API provides a really super fine fine grained uh, role based access control system, so we can actually control. The, the, the access to the API based on different APIs, API groups, different API objects on onto the level like like even sub objects that that yeah can a user read logs of a pod. And then of course, as the authentication stage kind of gives us the identities of the users, we 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 have to then tie the the users and groups into the role-based access control rules. And to do that, we, we, we basically, basically on our back level, uh, we, we, we create a set of roles, which define that, that what are the rules that are implied for this role? So in this example, I've, I've created a role called pod reader. Uh, it says that, that uh, whoever gets assigned a, this this specific role can can access pods and can access it with verbs get watch and list so basically all the all the verbs that are uh, intended for reading information from the API and then we use role bindings to bind a a user which for the RBAC itself it's just a string it's not an object or anything it's just a string we bind it to the role that we just defined. And of course we can, we can bind 
endpoint uh, users to the, to the roles either directly to a single user, or then we can also bind a, a group of users. And both remember that the, the both of these user and group information is pretty much always provided by something that is external to the API server itself. So it's not a, not a user information or group information object that we store on the API server itself. So having said that, uh, user really is a more or less like what I, I'm not sure whether this is a, I'm not a native English speaker, so, uh, but I, I always call, call user is as a, as a transient thing. So it's not, it's something that we, that we kind of uh, figure out on the fly. We keep the information in memory during the processing of the request, but, but that's it. There's, Kubernetes doesn't really store the information after that. Uh, the user identification and, and, and sort of authentication, of course, is, is more or less externalized from the API server point of view. Whether, whether I'm, I'm using term sort of because on the other hand, having the, the CA, the, the certificate authority, for example, stored along the API server on the node, it's whether that's really truly external or not, that's a that's a different discussion. But 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 at least from the API service point of API server point of view, it, it is an external thing. Uh, we learned that there's multiple ways to use external external identities for the users, static tokens, certificates, webhook services, and then open ID connect. And then we use roles and role bindings to tie the user identities in the set of roles telling that that okay what what a user can and, and and cannot do on the api server hopefully i provided the kind of uh good information for for people to kind of understand and get into the mindset that uh, that that yeah there's the user user management is is somewhat complex and and not that straightforward in Kubernetes. Well, what is what is straightforward in Kubernetes? But but uh, but at least gives you a, a kind of good segue into into learning more and 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 uh, diving diving into 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 more details into into each of the each of the different different options and and whatnot. I'll be hanging out on the on the event platform for the for the Q and A session and 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 with that I thank you.